Bye. All right. Congratulations to those who have made it to the very end of ETS 2024. Please be mindful that this is not the end. This is just the penultimate thing. So come on back to your tables. We're going to welcome a couple of wonderful people on stage. Gentlemen, if you'd please join me. We have Cameron Freeberg with Austin Energy. We have Jengis Yenerim with uh, NG. Yeah. And then we have Michael Pesson with the Department of Energy. Excellent. And before we uh, got on stage, Cameron was talking about how he's going to open up with a couple of jokes. So, Cameron? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> um, uh, none are energy conference appropriate. <laughs> the malfunction saved in the nick of time. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to be talking about the state of storage, which is definitely one of the more important conversations that needs to happen this week, for sure, because it's a big problem. Um, but before we do that, I really like to open things up so that people can just sort of explain a little bit more about themselves and we can get to know exactly who they are and why they do what they do. So with that, Michael, if you would, introduce yourself a little bit or talk about your projects and explain what motivates you to pursue energy innovation. So good afternoon, is it? No, it's still morning. Good morning, everybody. So uh, I am with the Office of Electricity at the United States Department of Energy. And our office is responsible for everything from your generator terminal to the meter on the side of the house. So what industry calls TND. And we'll, I'll talk more about this, but it's space becoming more and more complex, like everything in, in the grid today. So energy storage is becoming so important because you cannot really decarbonize the electric grid without energy storage. And the biggest motivation is making sure that we can address all the challenges, all of the above, as we call it. So this, the solution is not specific technology. The solution is how do you make sure that you, you can accommodate all the new emerging evolving technologies going forward? Because if you only focus on what we have today, you will fail long term. So you need to see into the future, you need to see the vision, and this crystal ball is my main tool, of course. So this crystal ball is what we use mostly. Uh, but seriously, we're doing a lot of analysis. We have 70 national labs, which are the national jewel. They have best in the world capabilities to do analysis, develop new technology. And this is what we're doing to make sure that the electric grid can support anything that happens in the future, whether it's supporting the carbonization, addressing all the threats, physical, cyber, and storage is just one of the many tools in our portfolio, but this is the very, very important tool. Thank you. Jengis? Good morning. Uh, my name is Jengis Sanyanerim. I'm in charge of uh, risk and strategy for NG's market-facing business here in the U.S. Um, what motivates me in, in this industry? I mean, I think usually the answer to these kind of questions usually start with um, some inspiring story for someone as a kid that saw something and decided they want to be energy. I don't have that kind of story. I just ended up here. Um, <laughs> but I guess what's worth mentioning is uh, when I got in here, I guess what kept me here is, uh, this is probably true for everybody who works for the utility industry here, is that our industry is something that keeps changing. There is no end to it. So this was true 50 years ago, but probably in the last 20, 25 years that the rate of change has become immense with the energy transition and it's become such a profound thing to do. And personally for me, um, for me to have uh, an interest on a subject, it has to be intellectually challenging for me. So that makes it difficult at home when we're having dinner and <laughs> deciding who's going to mow the lawn. But um, at, when I'm at work uh, in this kind of industry, that becomes very challenging and that's, that makes it very inter intellectually interesting for me. And uh, I'll just give one example. Uh, it was, I think, 2021. We were going through some restructuring in the company. I thought it was an opportunity for me to pursue something different. Things didn't pan out very well. So one of the offers in front of me, what I call the least of all evil, famous last words, <laughs> was to actually get this position in our trading business, which was just starting off at the time, relatively small. Um, we were signing our first power purchase agreements. Um, but turned out after three years, we're managing, I mean, my team went from three people to 20, and we're managing 
of the 10 gigawatts of renewable uh, assets. We have tons of PPAs to go alongside with that, roughly two gigawatts of storage that's going to come online soon, which we're going to talk about. Um, algorithmic trading, power trading, gas trading, all kinds of businesses. Targets grew fivefold. So, uh, more of the story is it's an industry that keeps changing. Our business is going alongside with that, and that's really the, the motivation behind uh, staying in this industry for me. Thank you so much. And Cameron? Yeah. Well, my name is uh, Cameron Freeberg. I manage the electric vehicles and emerging technologies programs at Austin Energy. Um, I was also formerly a utility strategist, as the slide shows, but I'm too lazy to update my LinkedIn, so it still says that. Um, so what we work on is a lot around you know, customer adoption and resources, a lot on the transportation electrification side, other emerging technologies, and I'll kind of cascade into what excites me about that. Uh, one, I've never heard the word sexy used on an energy panel as much as I did in the last one, uh, so there's that. Uh, secondarily is our customers and every average citizen, myself included, is having more interaction with energy than they have ever had before. And that's a lot of my focus. It's, it's, there's the grid side of things and how we integrate these technologies there, but there's the customer adoption side that you know, we want to enable our customers to adopt this. We want to maximize the benefits to them, whether it be energy storage, as we're going to talk about, uh, uh, vehicle electrification, you know, smart devices, all of that stuff. They're all part of that equation now. Each individual customer is. It's not that one-way flow of power plant, transmission, distribution, meter, customer, that's it. It's now uh, customers adopting these technologies, us figuring out how to integrate them in our system, maximize the value to both the grid as well as uh, our customers. And that's much trickier than it sounds. So being able to kind of be part of that transition is extremely exciting. You work way more externally than you ever did before, and that's probably one of the most satisfying parts of this transition. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and I completely agree. You know, I didn't expect to be in energy myself. Um, and now that I've been in it, it's really hard to leave because of all the things that you talked about, which I think at the heart of it all is people and solving puzzles, right? And solving puzzles that matter. Um, so in order to like get a, I think a lot of people here kind of understand a bit about the industry. That's why you're here, because you're amazing in, the, in it. Um, but like storage, specifically. What does the landscape look like right now? Um, and what are some of the barriers that exist? Um, Genghis, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, and I, I wrote this this morning because I was reading the news. Uh, I think it was very <laughs> fitting. Um, so I think the answer to the question really depends on what part of the country you're looking at. Um, mm. I mean, I think we're all in Texas right now, so it's probably worth mentioning where, where Texas is with respect to storage. And, and there are some other parts of the country. I think overall, Every state is going towards some kind of storage implementation, but obviously some of them are, uh, some of the states are moving faster than others. So I'll just share these two news articles that I read this morning. Um, one of them is related to California in Kaiso. Actually, on the evening of April 16th, which was two days ago, um, in the evening, uh, battery storage was pre uh, generating or injecting into the grid at a magnitude of six gigawatts. So this was an all-time high, and at that time, it was the largest resource in the grid. So um, renewables were producing about four, natural gas was about five gigawatts, there was hydro about four, and imports were about four. So storage, in fact, first time ever, I think, it was the largest type of resource on the grid. Um, on that same evening in Texas, in ERCOT, um, obviously this is a time of the year where uh, most uh, combined cycles and natural gas-fired power plants go into maintenance to prepare for the summer. So we don't have a lot of resources on the grid, and it was a day where wind was quite low. Um, but so when solar was ramping down at around 8 p.m., uh, the prices in the aircraft market shot up to $2,500 a megawatt hour. In some places, actually, it was $4,500 megawatt hours, $4,500 per megawatt hour. So. What happened? Did we have any issues with the grid? You didn't obviously see anything. Why? Because actually storage in Texas also was discharging when this happened at the rate of two gigawatts, which is also close to the all-time high. Uh, and this is just going to get bigger and bigger. So the reason I shared these um, articles, I guess, is because it's a super interesting time, and that's the good thing about the, the state of the storage business in, in the US. I guess what's bad or ugly um, this is a new technology. 
And what we're finding out as we're operating these assets, we're finding it uh, such that these are extremely complicated machines to operate, maybe not from a technical perspective, but from an economic perspective to be able to optimize and have the asset ready to operate when it's needed is an extremely complicated uh, part of business, requires a lot of forecasting capabilities and making sure you have really good communication. You need algorithmic trading, which is a business we trade, we started because you need to make decisions in five minutes and really yeah, use your assets. So long story short, I think it's, it's a great time to be in this industry and in this part of the business, which is storage. That's gonna just keep growing. Excellent, thank you so much. Cameron? Yeah. Uh, Genius, are you uh, implying that bringing a dynamic new technology into a 100 plus year old system then works seamlessly? So, because uh, that, that, on, the, on the good side, uh, for storage especially, you know, we've seen a lot of movement over the last six, seven years, I'd say, here in Texas. Um, you know, we've, we've done pilots where we put out residential, commercial, and grid scale storage uh, years ago over like a four year period, still have them out in the field to kind of do a testing phase with that. But now we're seeing the customer adoption side of storage really take off. And we've, uh, if you live in Texas, uh, you remember 2021 and 2023 very well probably uh, in terms of in the struggles we had here, you know, on, on the grid. And so that, you know, in uh, resulted in a lot of people wanting to install energy storage or backup systems in their homes. Uh, so that sparked a big growth of it. Um, you know, prices, prices of batteries are going down, technology is evolving. So we're seeing the technology side get better and better and better. And we're also seeing the use cases for it go up. So whether it be providing that backup power, whether it be market participation, uh, there's things that are uh, state level are doing like pilots for virtual power plants that help get these distributed energy resources aggregated and participate in like the energy market. So it's all getting figured out, but I'm happy to see it's not just happening on customers want this, and let them figure it out. It's more like the systems in place are uh, starting to be evolved too to give the customers that value. So that's, that's great to see. On the challenging side is you have a lot of companies doing this potentially. So aggregation, at least from a utility standpoint, is one of the you know, key things we have to figure out. And that's not new with just battery storage. That's every distributed energy resource that's gone out there. People that have started up thermostat programs, whether it be years ago or now, um, if you're doing them for like demand response, ex for example, you have to be able to aggregate those, to, uh, you know, cycle those in an aggregated fashion because you don't want grid operators or people following your markets to be having to go into like 30 different portals, get 30 different sets of reporting for either regulators or whatever it might be, um, and then all having kind of different performance controls. So aggregation is definitely one of the barriers because uh, you know, utilities don't want to be prescriptive of what's adopted at the customer level. They just want it to all seamlessly work together, which is a pretty tall ask. So, Thank you. And Michael? So as a DOE, we have a very special role in supporting the energy storage adoption, the research and development. So there's several aspects of our work that we're trying to do to help industry. So obviously R&D, research and development with national labs, what new technology can we uh, develop and help industry to adopt. But before we go into the technology conversation, which I would love to do, I'm a recovering engineer, so <laughs> I, I can, I wanna talk about adva advantages of lithium iron phosphate versus lithium nickel, nickel cobalt. So, but seriously, so we can't really talk about technologies without talking about what is the purpose. So it's about functionality, not about technology. And this is something that we realized a number of years ago when we tried to talk to wider communities about energy storage. What at least I real, uh, realized for myself is depending on what is the audience in front of me. When I say energy storage, people mean completely different things. So there's energy storage in this microphone right now, right? So it is energy storage, it's battery. So what we did is we tried to shape, or we did shape, uh, the conversation around energy storage. We divided it in three different categories. One is what we call bidirectional electrical storage. So this is the storage that can take electricity from the grid or from other sources and then put it back into the grid. Then it's chemical and thermal storage that doesn't have to be bidirectional. It still has a value to add. And then the third category, which is not energy storage at all, is something that people typically call demand response, but it's more than demand response. It's how do you manage your megawatts with N to provide similar function to energy storage. So all of these have the value. So once you uh, define these different types of technologies, now you can talk about functionality. So today, worldwide, the largest technology deployed is pumped hydro. So 90% of energy storage in the world is pumped hydro. 
and pumped hydro was built during the nuclear power plants era because uh, like uh, your intermittent sources, solar and wind have some challenges, nuclear energy also has some challenge, you can't really control it. So it's f very predictable, but it's very flat, so you need to be able to control it. So pumped hydro is used to do the daily balancing of, of outputs. But when we look at the uh, new d developments in, in energy storage, so we can't build a whole bunch of pumped hydro, you need to have special geography, even though we look in some companies that uh, have a solution or they claim to have a solution to deploy pumped hydro in any area in the ocean, in the lake, but that's something still to be developed. So as a result, the technology that being deployed is lithium ion. And it's because of uh, automotive industry, because the uh, economy is at scale, but lithium ion has limitations. And it's not just technological limitation, limitations, it's um, limitations in terms of cost reduction. So no matter how much you innovate, you still have the supply chain. And for those of you who follow what's happening in the industry with supply chain, like distribution transformers and other things, so we really don't want to be dependent on foreign supply chains, on something that has commodity pricing that we can't control. So we want to develop technologies that are independent from this. So there's a saying that to make battery dirt cheap, it has to be made from dirt and preferably local dirt, <laughs> right? So, but we're not just looking at batteries. We're looking at some other technologies. So that, like flow batteries, which is different animal from traditional batteries. We're looking at the thermal storage, bidirectional thermal storage. Uh, we're looking into the different batteries that are not lithium, like um, magnesium, uh, manganese, uh, there is uh, traditional lead, batteries that can be improved significantly. So there is a lot of R&D going into this, but the challenge is with utility adoption. Right? Nobody wants to be serial number one, and that's one of the reasons everyone keeps deploying these lithium batteries, because it's been proven, it works, and it's <coughs> lower risk for the industry. So one of our other roles to do is to accelerate adoption of new technologies. So we have some programs that I might be able to talk later about that allow us to validate this new technology so to, we can de-risk the adoption by the industry. And I think that's enough for the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a really great way to open things up. I mean, so I'm gonna just throw a slight curveball here because when people, I think when the consumers are thinking about battery storage, like EV adoption's increasing, people are thinking, oh, I'll be able to use my, my EV to help bring stuff back to the grid and it'll be great, or like, oh, I've converted my water heater and it's gonna be really cool. Um, what's the likelihood that that's happening as part of like storage? And then we can move on to the, the cool stuff. Uh, uh, appreciate the curveball. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that's going to be a huge part of the storage equation because one, you know, you're going to have customers that go out and install, you know, standalone battery storage, whether it be in their garage or their properties, uh, commercial businesses putting it, uh, you know, kind of on their property as well for reducing things like their demand charges, et cetera, et cetera. But we already have between 40 to 50,000 batteries on wheels here in Austin. And so the fact that you don't use your car nearly as often as you think you do uh, is one thing. Um, and having that as kind of a secondary asset to you can either discharge to your home or eventually back to the grid, I think that's going to be a real part of it because that's an asset you can use and kind of stack the value of that within your own. I mean, you're using a car probably 1% to 2% of its life. So having that battery available to do things like backup power, uh, ultimately participate in like maybe through your utility, like the energy market, things like that, and get other value out of it, it's gonna be huge. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen to get there. Uh, things like standardization, uh, you know, with it, whether it be like through a utility standards of like interconnecting that to a system, uh, getting that into your home, things like that, that has to exist. I mean, we came across uh, several, uh, just very, elementary things that weren't there uh, when we try to put batteries in the first time, things like fire suppression standards and, you know, permitting standards, things that didn't exist. Um, it's very hard to permit something when there's no permitting process to do it. Um, so uh, kind of paving that way for vehicles to allow for that too is, uh, is going to be necessary. And then on top of that is, yes, you can have vehicle to either vehicle to home technology, yeah, the customer gets value of that. But if we talk about vehicle to grid, and customers have the option to discharge a battery, send it back to the grid, benefit their utility, great. You'll have a very small subset of customers that want to do that because it's cool. You're gonna, the mass is gonna happen to that is 
utilities have to provide some sort of incentive or some sort of uh, mechanism to make customers want to do that. Am I going to voluntarily charge and discharge my battery over and over again just uh, for fun? Probably not. So uh, not just on vehicle to grid or things like that, but just distributed energy resources in general as we roadmap out what we want that to look like. If we're the ones getting value for it as a utility, then we need to translate that value to our customers. And so if with absent of that, yes, all those things will be out there, but will they be beneficial to you know, the grid, all of our customers, all that? No, that's where utilities and you know, regulators, those have to come in to kind of make that connection to the end owned device and then you know, the grid stability. So I know this is not a customer engagement panel, uh, but I think a lot of what you said really depends on how the utility is engaged with their customers because the truth is, and we talk about this, I think, for the past five years, so I'm not, I'm not going to parrot here repeating everything that I said over the last five years, but the utility industry in general, uh, this is changing, so it's good, but in general, it's terrible at engaging the customer. So even today, um, and without that engagement, that adoption, I think, is going to be quite challenging. Um, today, when you woke up in your hotel, what was the first thing you did? You probably just reached for the light, or it was hot or cold, so you reached for the uh, thermostat, or you probably reached for your phone and made sure that it was already charged. All of the, those three things depended on kilowatt hours to be available, but you didn't really think about kilowatt hours when you were doing those things. So, but unfortunately, the way the utility industry really interacts with people is through the bill, here's how much kilowatt hours you use. We don't really engage in terms of resilience or in terms of um, making sure the assets you own, such as an electric vehicle, really is, is a monetary thing that you can actually monetize. So I think that engagement part also is something, which obviously is not the topic of this panel, but something that has to be addressed at some point. So electric vehicles consumer engagement. So there was a big, big debate was going on in the industry when first electric vehicles showed up. What's the impact of the electric vehicles will be on the grid? And what I was saying from the beginning is, depending how you approach it, if you leave it unchecked, it will be something really bad happening to the grid because you're going to overload your distribution transformers, you're going to create new demand. But if you create ability to manage those electric vehicles, which are batteries on wheels, and do it in a way that customers can accept it, then it can be used to support the grid. But how do you do it so customers uh, don't object to that? So there's two ways of doing this, right? One, everybody wants to do the right thing, but when it comes uh, to real implementation, Nobody wants to be in the hot house or nobody wants to be getting into the vehicle when it's fully discharged and they need to drive to work. So which means you need to have some mechanisms that can manage it in a way that is transparent to customers. And I usually say the best control system, that the system that customer knows nothing about, is invisible. So it does it way in, in such manner that it does not affect cu customers' com comfort. Uh, it may seem to be challenging, but when you have thousands, so tens of thousands of customers, you have ability to aggregate all these resources. And one of the new, con well, new conversations in the industry going right now is VPP, virtual power plants. So if you take all these resources and you aggregate them, and we have FERC 2222, which allows you to support, to uh, aggregate uh, distribution resources, support a uh, bulk system. Now you can create this monetary value that you can pass onto the customers. Because at the end of the day, yeah, everybody talks about how they want to help, but they want to see what's, what is it for me. Or at least that nobody wants to be uh, inconvenienced by that. So this is something that we need to build in by design. So like, DOE has a big effort on, we call it V2X, vehicle to everything, uh, that allows to introduce different mechanisms, but it's not just technology, it's policies. So then I'm not gonna talk about it because it quickly becomes super complicated. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I would hope that y'all are thinking about some questions to ask the panel um, because they're pretty brilliant and wonderful. Um, we have about 20 minutes left, and so I might skip a couple questions just to make sure we have time for questions um, from the audience. But we kind of started touching on some cool solutions that are out there. But I think like more than just like what's available to solve these challenges is really how do you scale them outside of small pilots. And so if you would give an example of something that's really cool, um, that's a way to solve th this storage challenge, and then also think about you know what utilities or um, power providers or whoever should think about when they're scaling as well. So it's a two-part question. And Cameron, I'm looking at you. Oh, okay. I just saw you glaring over here. I did. So. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, yeah, for scaling this, um, I'll give an example, and it's, it's very old. This goes back to 2021. So this is, uh, you know, a pilot we did for the better part of uh, four years um, called Austin Shines, where we did do battery deployments at a commercial and utility scale. Um, battery systems have, a, they bring a lot of value. Um, everything from the grid side um, is completely different than like the value to residential. Um, you get different use cases there. And so we looked, I think when we mapped it out, there were like 19 different use cases to draw value for battery systems that we looked at. And it's going to be, to scale that and get actually like true values, you can't get 19 value extremes out of one asset. That's impossible. Um, but what you can do is you can start really properly identifying, oh, from the customer side, you know, here's what makes sense to us. Here's the data signals we need to like charge and discharge that asset. Same with the commercial side. Obviously, like a lot of the value to them is they have very high demand charges sometimes. So mitigating those things, like demand charges for those commercial customers. And on the utility scale side, uh, there's also, I mean, with the amount of renewables going online here in Texas, that kind of speaks for itself to a certain amount. This makes it more dispatchable, less intermittent. Uh, so there's a huge value to that. So. Um, making sure that you apply appropriate value streams to it, uh, making sure that you have the right data sets that kind of connect, you know, utility systems to those assets. And again, I'll harp on aggregation because that's one thing that's going to make it scalable too. You know, if you're controlling a couple hundred kilowatts here, a couple hundred here, um, you know, a small subset over here through like 40 different platforms, no utility is going to really want to do it that way. So. Uh, being able to identify value, do it in an aggregated, meaningful fashion uh, to either, you know, support voltage on the system, to, you know, work with in energy market pricing, things like that. Um, that's where I think that scalability is going to come up between those two areas. Thank you. Michael? So, again, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone. Uh, <clears throat> so, do we, uh, Office of Electricity has a very specific program, and so we're focusing just on uh, grid scale energy storage. So, we typically don't go beyond the, behind the meter, but even for grid scale energy storage, uh, ability uh, utility to deploy it really depends on business case. So, you need to have strong business case to justify this investment. And to be able to take, get your return on the investment, it's not just about technology, it's about economics. So there are multiple value streams that uh, your energy storage system can uh, allow you to monetize. But that's really reg regionally dependent and dependent on the utility. So I just was visiting uh, one utility in the south, and they deploy fairly small energy battery storage. And they use it exclusively for peak demand reduction, $40,000 a day saving. So their payback time is going to be like three years. So th this is wonderful. But you don't have to use it just for single purpose. You can do it for supporting ancillary services. You can use it for black start. You can use it for pretty much any, any utility needs. But to do this, you need to validate this. So one of the efforts or one of the programs that we have at the, at the office is uh, technology validation. So we're doing analysis for specific use cases. And we have a new program that had been funded uh, starting 2023 where we can take this technology, put it in the lab with hardware in the loop, and validate specific use case. So not just validating the technology performing uh, the way that uh, your manufacturer claimed, but how can it uh, perform under specific conditions within specific use case. And we look at this for what we call techno-social economic analysis. Because one big component of there is energy justice. How can you make sure that this technology can support everyone? Right, so it's easy for people who have high income to buy power walls with solar panels and take all the benefits, but we want to make sure that nobody's left behind. That this technology, when they deployed, has societal value for all communities, especially disadvantaged communities. So this is another big as aspect of this effort that we, we, we have. Thank you. And Jenkin? Um, bo both Cameron and Michael really touched on great points. And, and at NG, our solutions are not going to be as sexy. There you go. I used it. Maybe we can beat the panel, the last panel. Uh, they're not going to be as sexy. They're grid scale solutions. Um, <clears throat> but I, I do think they're very critical for the renewable boom, just like Cameron said. So um, one example is we've obviously we made a big bet as NG to, um, to invest in storage. So we uh, went and bought Broadreach Power last year integrated it, and we're developing a significant amount of grid-scale storage in, in ARCOT and in California. They're all lithium-ion, so not as fancy as, as what Michael was saying. Um, 
but that's a good point. But what's important is, for example, ARCOT last week came up with their load forecast. Um, for 2030, their peak load growth, they're projecting it to be at 152 gigawatts. That's just a number. But as a reference point, last year, the peak load was 86 gigawatt gigawatts. So, uh, and that was an all-time high. So ARCOT is projecting the grid's going to pretty much almost double in seven years. Yes, we're building a lot of renewable plants, but to Cameron's point earlier, we're not going to be able to just serve that load. Even if half that forecast is off, even if we just grow by half of that, that's still a huge amount. And just building renewables to serve that increase in load is just going to be impossible. Even today, it's challenging. In, in seven years, it will be impossible. So yes, batteries do have a place, uh, and we're investing in them. But we need to scale, to your question, and, and what's um, What's going to be needed for us to be scale these solutions is that uh, one IRA, obviously, it's it's a huge, huge tool. Uh, that's the reason even European companies like like mine are investing in the U.S. because you can't really get these kind of rates of returns anywhere else in the world. It's because of the IRA. The second thing I think that needs to happen that doesn't exist today is the products that are needed to be able to scale these solutions. So, for example, if you have a, if you build a renewable power plant. Um, the products that you can trade in the market to manage the exposure associated with a power plant are congestion revenue rights for basis exposure, you can sell block power, you can sell uh, renewable energy credits, you can sell block ancillary services. The problem is all of these products are designed for thermal assets. They're, they're block products, meaning you're basically selling a firm commitment, whereas your resource is intermittent, so it will only generate power when the wind is blowing or when the sun is shining. So. When you ask all of these developers to build these projects and they go out and try to finance the projects by uh, utilizing these kind of products, it's like giving a four-year-old a gallon of kerosene and a box of matches. So something like the winter storm Yuri is going to happen like it did in 2021. And all of these projects are going to go bankrupt because their unit is not producing and they're having to buy back all these commitments from the market price, which is at incredible prices. So. Uh, long story short, I think big energy giants like ourselves and I think banks that provide liquidity to the market, they need to come up with different products. They need to invent new products that are more tailored towards storage and, and renewables. Um, we're trying to do some of that, but I think that needs to accelerate. Once it does, I think that's going to help uh, with more adoption of these different technologies in the grid. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I think, you know, kind of at the root of all this is it really comes down to the people, right? There's a lot of education that has to happen on how to, to make these things work. And I'm not just talking about, like, engaging with customers to explain the benefits of these things and how they can take advantage, but also, like, internally within the utility space or within, you know, government programs and things of, like, how exactly we're going to get things from point A to point B and then launch, right? So thank you for all of that. I have one last question, um, although I can take a pulse. Who's got questions for our lovely panel? Raise your hand. OK, great. Excellent. OK, so one more question, and then we'll get to you. Um, my favorite question to ask panelists, especially for people who are in a constant state of communication with other professionals in their field, is what is missing from the conversation? Like, what's something that doesn't often get talked about that you really think should get brought to the forefront today? And with that, Jengis, if you'll kick us off. Um, well, it's not really left out, but I think we have to mention, we haven't mentioned it yet, I think the regulatory framework and basically the rules of the game, uh, that's something that always have to be discussed and it's, it's very important. Um, I mean, we overlooked in, in this panel, at least so far. Um, I'll give one example. For example, in ARCOT, um, NPRR, no, that doesn't mean anything for everybody, I think it stands for Nodal Protocol Revision Request. Uh, so ARCOT launched NPRR 1186, I think was the number, uh, which is basically a rule for battery storage. So battery storage resources are required to carry a certain level of state of charge to be able to sell certain products. Great. Uh, I'll just mention the uncertainty around this whole process. So ARCOT brought this up last year. ARCOT board approved it, I think around October, November timeframe. It went to the Public Utility Commission. Public Utility Commission rejected it, sent it back to ARCOT in February. ARCOT made some changes, approved it again, sent it to the PUCT, and I think they got approved this week, if I'm not mistaken. 
this is a rule, just one small rule, that affects the entire economics of, of a battery storage. And just the back and forth. I mean, I understand the regulators are trying to do their best to make the market work. Um, but that uncertainty and that really um, lack of speed to be able to get these things going, I think that's something that could potentially hamper the growth. Um, so I think that that needs to be discussed at some point. Thank you. Well, uh, my, my point, it was, it's part of the conversation, and I want to thank Michael for actually bringing it up earlier, is the, the equitable approach to this. Um, so again, I, I think primarily on the customer side um, and how we aggregate those resources, get them out there. That, that's where a lot of my focus is. But as utilities want to programmatically go forward, get value from batteries, it's a real-time dischargeable asset, chargeable asset, I mean, that's all great. Um, but then when we look at where we make those investments, um, if you set up just incentive structures, bring them in, how do you avoid just giving access and those resources to those with the most capital, being able to adopt those resources, and then providing them funds and those benefits early on, and then not doing that across your entire community? That, that's a big piece of it, too. So when we look at, like, store and investment, on the grid side, yes, those benefits are realized across our entire population. Those are kind of, uh, they cascade, uh, they go across everybody. When we do it at the local level, how do we uh, engage, like, you know, community members for things like community resilience uh, for storage implementation, and how do we make sure that we're not just uh, putting something kind of passive out there, it gets adopted by, you know, th those communities first, and then, like, you know, subsidies decline, and when those that might need access to that capital and things like that need it, maybe they're not there anymore. So just uh, proactively making those investments that impact your entire community more than just where customer adoption is going to happen first. So, and again, Michael, thank you for bringing that up. So. Okay, so the question was missing from conversation. So I don't think anything missing. I hope that I know what's, what conversations are going on. What is missing are answers to the questions. And one big challenge in the United States is the way the whole grid is organized in terms of uh, regulatory environment. So we have FERC that regulates bulk system. We have a whole bunch of 50 states plus Puerto Rico plus other territories who regulate their systems. And alignment between those is very challenging. So we find it uh, almost every time when we try to come up with a solution, it is regionally specific. It's not not too many things that can be universally applied across the entire country because you have to consider what are the specific to the regional uh, policies, what are specific to environmental, uh, in, in environmental issues there. So there is a lot of different, difficult challenges going on. But the other thing, what is really missing from the conversation, which, well, I'll get myself in trouble, but I say it. So we don't have nationwide policy on, on, on transmission planning, on the overall system planning, right? So every state has its own policy. Uh, uh, every transmission line developer wants to do something. But when you look at the big picture, how do you balance this? So for example, I'm a big proponent of HVDC. So if we have more HVDC in the grid, we can accomplish a lot of th many things, right? We can integrate more renewables. We need to have multi-terminal HVDC so we can serve underserved communities. So there is a lot of things that need to happen. But how do you introduce to the national level? So th this, this is some of the challenges. And then what are the policies that need to be pu put in place that can support adoption of new technology? I always, when I have my PowerPoints, I always show this Venn diagram. There is a technology, policy, and markets. And, uh, Technology cannot succeed if it doesn't have market that will support this technology. And market will not exist without right policy. So we need to set this policy not after the fact. Like one example is we have a lot of effort for electrification. So industrial electrification is going to go full speed ahead. Uh, anybody thought about how to make sure that these electrified loads will serve utility and not just vice versa, similar to electric vehicles? I don't see this conversation uh, going yet. I asked a question yesterday at the panel, and it, it, it apparent to me that people don't talk about this yet. But if you're going to have gigawatts of new electrical loads that's potentially flexible, but you need to plan for this, right? You need to think about this in advance. So if you electrify, so one example, I'm not going to name a specific place, but e electrification of the steam plant. So you have a thermal inertia, inertia that can be uh, translated into the uh, demand response that's not going to affect these loads, but going to support industry. But can you take advantage of this uh, function? Can you uh, incentivize this industrial facility to invest 
in additional control mechanisms that will support these operations, we don't talk about this yet. So we have the conversations, we know the questions, but we don't have all the answers. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so it's time for you and all of your questions. Sir, if you would. Uh, hey, my name is Nivon. Uh, I work for an uh, electric vehicle company, and we uh, utilize battery integrated chargers. And uh, I have a specific question for Cameron and Shengison. Uh Sorry, I hope I didn't butcher your name, but uh, I don't know if you all have heard about the uh, aggregate distribute. Um, one, one moment. Uh, aggregate distributed energy resource pilot project with ERCOT. Um, maybe you can. Uh, explain the intent uh, to the crowd a little better of, you know, about ERCOT's intent with ADER, your experience with it, and kind of like how it's changed your relationship with the, uh, the spinning reserves uh, market in your area, and just, you know, your experience with it. Yeah, I, I know enough about it to give a lot of bad information probably, but uh, I'll, I'll try. So that, that's at a high level, I mean, that's kind of ERCOT's push into piloting how these distributed energy resources come into like the markets of the of the grid here in Texas of how they you know basically how how these as opposed to just like power plants things like that how do these distributed energy resources start to participate in that um, so uh, you know they're kind of creating like a virtual power plant model and there's a lot of companies that are opting in I mean Tesla was a big driver of this pilot kind of getting stood up uh, or a big uh, pusher for it and then you have you know utilities um, transmission distribution companies, and then, you know, aggregation companies kind of participating in it. How that's going to drive for things like spinning reserve in those other markets, I'm not quite sure yet, but I do know that they're in phase one right now, if you're aware, and going to phase two, or like developing the rules for phase two. Uh, so it's going to keep evolving, and, you know, we don't have an active role in it yet, but I feel like we're going to kind of push from not participating yet to being very well positioned to be a part of it, just the way that we already do aggregation with distributed energy resources, uh, also on the vehicle side. So it's not just uh, how we manage demand, but also potentially how we can, you know, provide uh, provide load also back to the system as well through like the way that these market regulations are stood up. Um, but I probably already passed my level of expertise how much I know about it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, we in NNG at that distribution level uh, resources, we, we don't really um, do a lot of analysis on that, but I can speak to your second part of the question about spinning reserves. So spinning reserves obviously is a roughly 3,000 megawatt market in ARCOT, and if you look at it, the amount of battery storage is just, just coming online in the next two or three years. I mean, I cannot offer price views here, obviously, because of legal reasons, but uh, if you consider all of that battery storage that's coming online, along with all these things that uh, VPPs and ADR, if you add all on top of that, you know what's going to happen when all these resources that are capable of providing this service, if it floods the market, which is a small 3,000 megawatt market, you know what's going to happen. So uh, I wouldn't rely on that uh, to, to, as, as a long-term uh, revenue stream to, to be able to finance these things. Excellent, thank you. We have two minutes left. If there's another question, yes. Hi, uh, Cheryl Velasco with Rappahannock Electric Cooperative. Um, how can we as utility professionals help alleviate some of the concerns about the environmental impacts of the manufacturing of these storage, specifically batteries um, and end of life disposal? Yeah, I, I'll take a first shot. Uh, so I, I think I mentioned a little bit about the lithium batteries being uh, dependent on the supply chain of rare earth um, materials. So like right now we have significant challenge because of the war in Ukraine. So Russia has the biggest, uh, sup uh, biggest supply of nickel in the world. So we, we see the supply disru disruptions with the nickel. Uh, so this is supply chain. As far as environmental impact, I think it's very closely connected. So the cobalt, uh, I'm sure you've heard all the story, stories about the child labor in Africa uh, uh, that uh, mining for cobalt. Uh, what are the environmental regulations there? I I'll let you guess. Not very good. So when we look at the, uh, typically for any system, when we look at the um, carbon footprint, we look at the life cycle. So you, you have to produce, so it has emissions. Then you have to operate, it hopefully doesn't have emissions, 
but then you have to dispose. It has another set of emissions. So when you're analyzing any technology in terms of uh, what is the imp environmental impact, you have to look for the entire life cycle from the cra cradle to, to, to grave, and this is the only way to um, compare apples to apples. Otherwise, it's really unfair comparison. And that's about time. So could we please give the panelists a big round of applause, closing down the show. Thank you. Come on, tight.